Hi, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me make sure I'm not on mute. Okay, not. Um, hi, and welcome, everyone, near and far. Uh, my name is Tasneem Mandiwala, and I'm the organizer of this panel conversation series. Um, I thank you all for joining us today for our first conversation in the series Dismantling Anti Blackness in Non Black Communities of Color, sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the Center for Identity and Inclusion at the University of Chicago. Uh, before I dive into introducing our panelists, I want to share with you a short manifesto of sorts regarding the conversation we're about to have. This panel is a form of protest. It is an effort to speak back to the social, racial, political, economic, and cultural systems in which we are all embedded, and an organized push to look inward to our communities of color to increase lived solidarity with Black individuals and communities. We not only acknowledge that as non-Black people, we cannot understand the depth or breadth of racism Black individuals are subjected to in the US, but also acknowledge that as communities, we have been bystanders and therefore participants in this racism for too long. We come together to protest against police oppression against Black lives, but also against our own biases and prejudices. The panel's approach is one of radical love, which does not mean forgive and forget, but rather hold accountable with compassion and remember so as not to repeat. It means using our rage to dismantle an aggressively racist system step by difficult step while still acknowledging the intersectional humanity of us all. This idea of radical love is borrowed from Bell Hooks, who says that without love, we are unable to see the full picture of oppressive systems, fighting against one while accidentally upholding another. She states, quote, in this society, there is no powerful discourse on love emerging either from politically progressive radicals or from the left. The absence of a sustained focus on love in progressive circles arises from a collective failure to acknowledge the needs of the spirit and an overdetermined emphasis on material concerns. Without love, our efforts to liberate ourselves and our world community from oppression and exploitation are doomed. As long as we refuse to address fully the place of love in struggles for liberation, we will not be able to create a culture of conversion where there is a mass turning away from an ethic of domination." End quote. White capitalist patriarchy has shown us the horrifying results of racist domination, one outcome of which is dividing and conquering those it wishes to dominate. This panel is a call to our communities to not remain divided when it comes to defending our fellow Americans from multiple types of oppression, including horrifically even death. In conjunction with our particular immigrant and minority struggles and barriers, it is a demand to our communities to acknowledge the privileges we may hold and to use these privileges to fight for what is right. Acknowledging privilege will mean acknowledging our complacency with the systems that have led to so much death and violence against Black Americans. It will require examining one's entire world from the language used to the people interacted with to the way one lives their life. It will mean you must be consciously and actively anti-racist rather than simply being neutral because in a racist society, there is no neutral. We reach out to you with the maintenance of hope and progress and a firm standing in the values of human dignity and respect for all. So a little bit about the panelists and what this conversation series hopes to bring about. So this conversation brings together many voices from different backgrounds and fields of expertise. We hope to provide you with an introduction, because that's all we can really do in this short time, to some of the systemic ways non-Black communities of color have implicitly or explicitly participated in anti-Black racism. This will include aspects from larger political ideas that may be obvious, smaller everyday details that may require a longer pause for understanding and processing, and everything in between. Each panelist will also provide two to three actionable ideas that you can do to change the conversations being held within your communities. Um, and importantly, I want to emphasize that even though our panelists do have specific insights into particular communities of color, even within these communities, of course, there are nuances, differences, and hugely varied inter and intra-racial experiences on individual and systemic levels. Um, so a general breakdown of what we're going to be doing today. Um, we'll have presentations from each one of our panelists, followed by a question and answer session at the end. Um, so as you're listening, please, of course, feel free to submit um, questions to the Q&A box if you're joining us through Zoom um, or the Facebook chat if you're joining us through Facebook Live. And we'll try and address as many as we can um, at the end. 
So with that, um, we've had a slight change in panelists, but I now have the great pleasure of introducing you to three dynamic individuals who have in different ways engaged with and are engaging with dismantling racism within their own non-Black communities of color. First, we have Dr. Catherine Fung. Um, she is a former professor turned high school teacher based in Oakland, California. She specializes in Asian American literature and serves as a contributor and editor for the blog Unmargin. Dr. Fung organizes with Asians for Black Lives and also tries to teach her students how to engage in direct action work. Her, pronoun her pronouns are she and her. Next, Sadaf Jaffer is a scholar, activist, and elected official. Dr. Jaffer is a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University, where she teaches courses on South Asian, Islamic, and Asian American studies. She is also the mayor of Montgomery Township, New Jersey, where she has focused her administration on good governance, increased transparency, communications, diversity, and inclusion. And finally, Vanessa Angelica Villarreal is the author of the 2019 Whitting Award winning collection, Beast Meridian, a 2019 Kate Tufts Discovery Award finalist and winner of the Texas Institute of Letters John A. Robertson Award for Best First Book of Poetry. Her work has been recognized with the 2019 Poetry Foundation Friends of Literature Prize and has appeared in the New York Times, Poetry, Boston Review, the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day and elsewhere. She is a doctoral candidate in Los Angeles, where she's raising her son with the help of a loyal dog. And finally, um, our moderator today is Dr. Yoon Sun Choi, a professor at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, specializing in the importance of race, ethnicity, and culture on minority and immigrant adolescent youth development in the US. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Yoon Sun. Thank you, Tasman. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Yoon Sun Choi, today's moderator. Just as a reminder, um, as you're listening to the presentation of the three panelists, um, when the question comes up, please put them on a Q&A box if you're using Zoom box or some other box on a Facebook Live, which I have not used, so I don't know where to put the questions. Um, and now we'll facilitate questions after the presentation by the three panelists. Uh, Tasman did a great introduction, so uh, without further ado, I'll pass the stage to the panelists. Um, we will go by the order, uh, the way that they were introduced. So we can start with you, Catherine. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to do a share screen because I've got a PowerPoint. Hopefully this works. Um, all right. Is it in present mode? No, it's not. Okay. Um, so I'm so glad to be here. Um, I view solidarity work as, and dismantling racism as a constant lifelong process that involves every aspect of, facet of our lives, um, which, is my, which is why my presentation will be anchored on my personal journey navigating this work as a student, as a teacher, as a scholar, and as an activist. Um, my sort of lifelong journey has been about putting all of these parts of my life in alignment. Um, and so that's why I sort of present, you know, my life as, you know, uh, solidary work as life alignment as kind of my main theme. A um, little bit about myself. Um, there's a little family picture there. Um, I am Chinese American. I am. Uh, I was born in the U.S. I'm a daughter of post-1965 immigrants from Vietnam and from Taiwan. Um, I became politicized in college um, via ethnic studies. Um, I ended up, you know, getting a PhD in English, specializing in Asian American literature. Um, I was a professor at one point. Um, left because I uh, left academia because having to work in a racist environment for a racist institution within a racist system was rather soul crushing. Um, not something that I've necessarily escaped entirely um, because I do currently work for a private high school. Um, you know, so that is something that I'm constantly negotiating with myself, which I think might be familiar to a lot of people. Um, my, uh, my work has become, is, you know, became a complicated thing for both myself and for my family. Um, from my training, I cultivated a set of vocabulary um, and framework that is unfamiliar to most members of my family, right? Uh, my parents don't even necessarily identify as Asian American, let alone as people of color, right? And, um, and so in a lot of ways, my own kind of sense of empowerment um, also became fodder for some intergenerational conflict, right? And so I think that's also something that a, a lot of um, kids of immigrants might also identify with. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Anti-blackness certainly exists in my family. Um, and that's something certainly that they brought over from the old country, but also became exacerbated from being in the US. In other words, I usually like to 
defy the kind of assumption that like somehow the US is more progressive and more liberal, you know, um, in a lot of ways, the US actually taught them how to be more racist. Um, and some of the ways that, that it does that is, you know, our trajectory of quote unquote success was predicated on assimilating and aspiring to whiteness, right? Um, this idea of having to, you know, get a house in a good neighborhood with good schools, right? Sending your kids to prestigious schools, making money um, in the sort of traditional kind of corporate ladder, right? Um, and in a lot of ways, I made good on that, um, you know, as a, as a good daughter who went to good schools and got a PhD and so forth. And so in a lot of ways, being, you know, what is termed the model minority, right, for an Asian American also means upholding white supremacy. Um, and we can certainly we talk a lot more about about that um, in my family too I mean any kind of not only are they sort of you know have they absorbed a lot of the kind of racist uh, popular culture that exists right um, in the US but any particular negative interaction with black people um, just affirmed a lot of those prejudices right I have a, a, a memory of when my grandfather who was living in Oakland at the time got mugged by a black man I mean that was like it only just you know kind of affirmed for him so many of the things he so, so many of the prejudices he already held on to um, and so that can be very hard to undo, right? And so my point here is to say that, you know, dismantling racism isn't just about education. Um, it's about healing, right? There's a lot of healing and also, you know, um, and it has to be a sort of love motivated healing too involved. And that's also very hard to do. Um, most of us aren't trained to do that. Um, my family has changed and evolved in time, you know, um, in terms of um, our kind of attitudes um, about race, you know, and it's not, again, it's not just about me being, you know, the, you know, the, the daughter with the ethnic studies training that kept, you know, poking at them, though certainly I've done a lot of that, um, but it's also about sort of inviting in, right? So um, I've done, protesting and activism for a long, long time. But the first protest that I actually took my mom to was uh, for Trayvon Martin uh, after the Zimmerman verdict. And, you know, I, she just kind of wanted to go with me because she was curious. And so that became a really bonding experience for what for us because it was the first time I kind of let her into that part of my life, a part of my life that I tended to hide from her because I just didn't want her to worry. You know, I didn't want to have to explain myself to her. Um, and so, you know, and so to give you an idea of sort of where my family is now, like recently, very recently, my family actually, we have this like family text thread. And we had this hilarious conversation via text message initiated by my brother, I have a younger brother, and he just asked, hey mom, how do you say fuck the police in Chinese? And so it just kind of, there was this like back and forth about like, well, do you want to say it in Cantonese or Mandarin? How would you write it out in a poster, et cetera, et cetera. And so that kind of gives a little bit of an anecdote of how, how perhaps our attitudes are constantly shifting, right? Um, so all of this, you know, little sort of background information, you know, on my family life is just, is just, is just to say that um, solidarity work begins at home um, and uh, and I, I've learned over the years that I'm not able to compartmentalize different parts of my life you know as much as that was my you know my, my first impulse right um, I I recently took a webinar on Asian American solidarity work um, in which one of the panelists Fad Ahmed from this really great group uh, drum uh, which stands for Desi's rising up and moving he said something that was so spot on which is that we can't expect to do solidarity work with others if we're not in solidarity with ourselves all right it's so easy to shame and judge those within our own community for not being woke or not being you know um, proficient in the language of social justice and so forth um, but that's just not generative and that's not driven by radical love right and so that's just a reminder there um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about which was what I was asked to talk um, to come here to talk about is uh, my work with Asians for Black Lives um, and so just a little bit about about who we are. Um, we are not an organization, but we are organized. And this is a group that started in late 2014, and that was before I joined, um, with uh, a shutdown action of the Oakland Police Department, and this was in solidarity with Ferguson. And so I have here um, some links to, uh, you know, who we are that, and our guiding principles. Um, maybe later I'll go ahead and put those, or maybe most, maybe one of the, uh, other moderators can can help me put them up there on the chat window for the panel for uh, attendees, um, but. Uh, 
it is, we are a loose affinity group. Primarily, we do nonviolent direct action in solidarity with other politically aligned organizations in the Bay Area. Um, and so what this means is that we are not so much involved in things like electoral politics, you know, or, or campaigns for things like access, but rather it's about directly interfering with, it, with an unjust system or an unjust practice and oftentimes using our bodies, um, you know, for that. And so some examples of the kind of work that we've done. And so there was, you know, the, the shutdown of the of the police department but most recently for example we did we assisted in a defy the curfew action in oakland and we also have been doing like wake up calls at city council members and uh, school board members um, and right now it's all around def uh, defunding the police right and so um and we actually have you know i think just today i i read that the uh the Oakland Unified School Board um, just voted to, you know, to to do, to cut any contracts with OPD, and so that's a that's a victory, a recent victory, um, and so that gives you a little bit of idea of the kind of work um, that we do. Um, we also have released a recent solidarity statement, and so I've got the link over there as well. Um, and uh, and the most important thing that I kind of want to emphasize here um, is that we take our cue from Black organizers who have been doing this work for years. Uh, we do not work on our own, and among some of the Black-led organizations and groups that we've been working with uh, include like the Anti-Police Terror Project, um, the uh, Black Organizing Project, um, to, you know, um, so there's, you know, so that's really important that we really take our cue from them. Um, mm -hmm. Among our guiding principles, ones that I want to kind of highlight, um, you can sort of take your time to read it on the website, um, but these are two points that I wanted to highlight in particular. It is, uh, so one, we acknowledge that we as Asians have often been used as part of a divide and conquer strategy to uphold white supremacy, and we refuse to be used as tools to uphold a racist and violent system. Um, and another point, many of our communities have faced state repression and capitalist violence in our homelands, and many Asian Americans are particularly vulnerable to state violence, including refugees, those targeted by surveillance and profiling, those who are undocumented, and those who are Sikh or Muslim, including police violence. We recognize that we are targeted differently than Black people, and we also recognize the relationship between racist, militarized police forces waging wars on Black people and imperialist forces waging wars on our homelands. We are determined to resist both. Um, so that gives you a little bit of information about Asians for Black Lives, um, and I'm happy to take more questions about the work that we do, of course. Um, so as far as like things that I've learned um, from, from my journey, um, we always have to emphasize community. Every part of, the, of this work relies on community building um, because this kind of work requires trust. And that's something that I particularly learned from doing direct action because if you're going to embark in something where you potentially might get arrested, you obviously have to trust the people that you are working with, right? Um, and I also wanna sort of remind us all that we want to activate the networks that we already have. Again, Asians for Black Lives is sort of just started as a hashtag. Um, it's not an official organization. And oftentimes, especially now, we have a lot of people wanting to onboard, which is great. Um, and it's, it's funny because oftentimes there's this sort of assumption that like, oh, there's like an official kind of process or membership and, and things like that. And you know, and, and of course, and, and we, you know, we've sort of in time have developed some protocols and things only because of like concerns about security. Um, but I also want to remind people that we are all already parts, part of community and networks. Um, and you don't have to join an organization in order to, or even build one to do this work. You know, you can change how your PTAs are operating, your churches, your workplaces, you know, et cetera. And so I think, um, I mean, how I got plugged into A4BL was actually through a friend, you know, I, you know, I didn't just sort of show up as a stranger. And so oftentimes the way that we build community is precisely through the networks that we already have. Um, other things that I've learned. Um, some things can only be learned from just doing, right? I've spent a lot of my life as an academic reading and analyzing, but there's a, there's a difference between that and like putting your body and your money and potentially your job on the line. And so my point is that being in solidarity requires deep reflection about what you are willing to sacrifice. Um, I don't know if you're all able to see this uh, handout that I've also put on the screen, um, but this is also a really great, uh, you know, just a great graphic that, um, that uh, I that was shared with me um, again created by um, by the organization drum and I just love this kind of idea of different levels of solidarity a lot of us are able to do number one right symbolic solidarity where you sort of make a statement of solidarity and then there's transactional where like all right I show up for you you show up for me 
once you move into embodied solidarity, that's where sort of a lot of direct action um, is sort of in that realm, right, where you are actually kind of, um, you know, putting your body on the line um, in order to sort of live according to your visions and beliefs. And then what we're trying to build at this moment, or not just this moment, but in general, right, the long, the long view is transformative solidarity, right, um, where we're really kind of trying to, where we're trying to build a world that really hasn't existed before, um, you know, and so to sort of get to, you know, level four, it takes a lot of kind of self-reflection. Um, and so again, a reminder that we're trying to build a world that we, that's never existed before. This also doesn't mean that we have to constantly reinvent the wheel, right? Because people have been doing this work for ages. Um, I love the Audre Lorde quote, right? That says, revolution is not a one-time event. So this isn't just about onboarding or plugging in momentarily, you know, but constant building and, and, and evolving. Um, so that's it for me. I'm going to leave you with uh, one more slide, which is just a bunch of resources here. Um, so we've got, uh, if you're interested in A4BL's social media presence, we've got a link tree there. Um, this really, there's a really great toolkit here that I recently discovered as well um, from a webinar that I attended, the Asian American Racial Justice Toolkit. Asians for Black Lives was involved in building this toolkit. And then, um, and there's also this great Google Doc, um, Black Lives Matter Translated, where there's a lot of resources that have been translated into different languages. Um, so I just want to leave you with that. Um, but thank you all very much. Thank you so much. And you know, we'll make sure that your slides uh, will be available along with the video of this session. Thank you. So as our next um, a presenter, uh, Sadaf, is going to talk, I do uh, notice that there are several questions coming up in Q&A. And we will, I'm collecting them, um, and we'll pose the questions after the two additional presentations. With that. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. Uh, and I'm already learning so much uh, about my own work and its location and how to kind of strengthen myself for the struggle because it's tough. Um, so my research in, my academic research is on Islam in South Asia, and I particularly look at ideas of the secular and, and feminist thought among Muslims in South Asia. In my teaching practice, I teach courses on Islam in South Asia through literature and film and South Asian American literature and film. And I was really excited to have the opportunity to teach in an Asian American studies context because I started teaching when they were just starting to offer such courses at Princeton, and there often isn't so much of a focus on South Asian communities in Asian American studies programs. So I know that that's been something that's been of use to students. I see one of my primary goals in my teaching to, to focus on solidarity, specifically solidarity with the struggle against uh, anti-Black racism. And the roots of that, you know, go far and deep and start, you know, are already in existence and are in existence in South Asia itself. The legacy of colonialism and a hierarchy of racial hierarchy, as well as uh, the, the remaining colorism are all things that immigrants and those from South Asia bring with them when they come to the United States. And so there's a prehistory, um, as, as Catherine uh, referred to as well. And then it, but it really is the American experience that inculcates white supremacy and its American flavor and um, the way in which we kind of breathe this racial hierarchy and desire to aspire to white ideals. Um, but this was not always the case. And what I teach in my courses is that the earliest waves of migration from South Asia to the United States were people who moved here um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they, they mixed in with communities of color. So on the West Coast, there were uh, migrants primarily from Punjab, the, the region of Punjab in South Asia. And on the East Coast, there were uh, immigrants from uh, the Bengal region of South Asia. And that I think is very eye-opening for students because they've never heard about these waves of migration, that there were South Asians in this country that early. And so it's from that point that I, that I try to emphasize for them that we don't hear about these immigrant stories because they didn't um, become part of the white American story. They became part of the story of communities of color. And that is why they just don't fit and they're not given that focus 
uh, when it comes to histories of immigration and waves of immigration to the United States generally. I mean, there are better um, places, there are places that, that do teach this history, but when I've asked my students, most of them have not learned about this before coming to the classroom. But, you know, in the post-1965 uh, context where we saw much increased levels of immigration from Asia generally and from South Asia specifically, I think, again, that people are not aware of the prehistory of what took place to make that happen, of the racist immigration regimes that were in place that did not allow migration from Asia, that kept the, the vast majority of immigrants coming to this country white by design and did not allow um, Asian Americans to get citizenship and run for office and all of those things that now are very natural. And, and as you heard from myself, I, I myself am an elected official. So that often comes as a shock to many of my students as well. How central the civil rights movement and, and, and black movements in the United States were to their ability to even be here. Um, and that's something that I always try to emphasize as well. Um, now, I'm going to shift a little bit to my role in an elected uh, position. So I live in uh, Montgomery, New Jersey, which is in central New Jersey, just north of Princeton, where I teach. And it's a suburban community with a 65% white American population, a 30% Asian American population, and a, about 2% Black population, 2% Hispanic population. And, and that's, that's kind of the breakdown for you. So you can get a sense of the type of community that it is. Um, and frankly, this is a very, this is a time where a lot of people are finally paying attention to the ways in which anti-Blackness pervades the community, whether it's the types of racism that Black students face in our school districts, or you know, the suspicion and the calls that, you know, the police are called if they see a Black person walking down the street, basically. Um, so we're having to come to terms with this. And um, I have tried my best in my capacity to, to really say that we need to do this, that we cannot ignore the moment. We have to bring in and specifically listen to the Black community in, in town. And uh, you know, one of the things that I've been working on is having facilitated uh, working sessions for members of the Black community in our town with our police uh, directors and uh, police leadership to see what their concerns are, what issues have been, how can we improve. Um, and similarly, that has been my advice to the school board as well, that, you know, they and they are establishing some uh, Black parents groups as well as I, I really think they need to have uh, groups for recent alumni who have gone through the experience and have really experienced horrific, uh, horrific situations in the schools. And I'm sad to say that a lot of the, like, you know, a significant amount of the anti-Black racism does come from Asian American students as well. And so, you know, in our town, there's an Instagram page called Black at Monty. There are similar pages like that for different communities in our neighboring uh, towns, and they share their experiences and not coming from, you know, the white classmates, but also from Asian American classmates. And in a town like ours, that model minority myth is really pervasive and it's so seductive. It, I, I think it really is seductive to both the parents and the children that, oh, well, you know, obviously we are just inclined to be in all the AP classes and to do X, Y, Z. And um, there isn't an acknowledgement of the ways in which the communities that we are benefiting from living in have been built on the labor of Black Americans. And the wealth that has accrued has been built on their labor and they have been deprived of access to the benefits of the, that labor. And so that's something that I'm trying to kind of re reinforce and talk about. I'm also proud to say though, that a lot of the young students who have been very active in working in solidarity with their black classmates and the community members, um, we had a Black Lives Matter rally in my town that had 700 people at it, which was 
wonderful. I mean, it is not something I would have expected a few years ago. Um, this town is waking up and, um, but you know, we have to keep pushing beyond just symbolic. Yes. First of all, I mean, it's amazing, unfortunately, to see the um, receptiveness to the, to the concept and the call that Black Lives Matter now compared to what it was a few years ago. And I know that a lot of people have talked about how, you know, organizers were told that that was too scary or there was something that was never going to, that the general population was never going to accept that call. And now it's gained in popularity and it's gained in acceptance as, as something that needs to be said as a term of solidarity. And I've been proud to see even the governor saying it, our attorney general in New Jersey. I mean, that would be unexpected a few years ago and it certainly wasn't said before. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I find myself in a very odd position because I'm the only South Asian woman uh, mayor in my, in my state and um, one of the few in the country, one of the few Muslim women mayors in the country as well. And so I sit at this particular space between a community that is majority white, but has a significant Asian population, but not a very large black population. And then the administration, the police department, which is overwhelmingly white. And um, trying to bridge that, it's, it's something that I try my best to do, try not to lean too much on my black allies and do the learning myself and struggle through it myself. Um, but, you know, I've been thinking about how I, I don't, I'm not connected specifically with a South Asians for Black Lives or an Asians for Black Lives group, but I think that that would be good for me um, because, you know, it's, it's a difficult kind of navigating space to be, you know, a non-Black person of color advocating for, you know, for, for, these, for the struggle. So that's a little bit about my story, what I've been trying to do, what I try to do in my classes, as well as in my organizing and in, in my role as an elected official. Um, there's something that I keep hearing that, you know, nobody ever gives up their power by choice. They have to be forced to do it. But I reject that. You know, I think that we have to, we have to be willing to give up our power. You know, we have to be willing to share and make sure that um, that opportunity is, is done in an equitable fashion, not to hoard it for ourselves, um, and not to ride on that wave of the model minority myth and say, oh, well, we're able to be successful and it helps us because we're placed in all the AP classes, whereas our black classmates are told, you know, no, that's probably not the class for you. We need to make sure that for ourselves and for our children that we're not taking benefits that are undeserved and that we're making sure every child has the same opportunity. So um, this is what I'm, what I'm working on in my space and I'm just so thankful to be here and be a part of this conversation and to learn uh, from you all. But it's, I would say that this, this is the biggest crisis facing our country and our society. It's the biggest emergency. Um, and that's how I'm approaching it, that this has to be the absolute priority of my, my time uh, in my elected position and uh, as well as in my teaching. So thank you for, for including me and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Great, thank you so much. Um, again, um, I do see several questions popping up in Q&A. Uh, there are some common themes and thread that I do see. So I think I'll be able to consolidate and then pose the question to the panelists. So Vanessa, you wanna take away? If you can unmute you first. <laughs> Thank you. I'm still getting used to Zoom. It's been, I, know. I, I can't get the buttons. Um, I was actually gonna start out with a poem uh, this time, um, but actually the way that the uh, you know conversation has evolved, I think I might end with the poem if we have time, because um, I think the, Conversation has momentum, and I'd like to just pick up where my lovely um, co-panelists have left off. Um, I think anti-blackness in, in the Latinx community is, is um, you know, it's specific. Uh, you know, we have 
a lot of um, shared experiences of race, uh, shared you know social spaces, institutional spaces, um, neighborhoods, um, shared experiences of structural violence, racial violence. Um, but at the same time, uh, we are beneficiaries of um, you know white privilege, um, and that's to say that. Latinx people, um, you know, come from <laughs> Latin American countries that are part of the same system of colonization, um, have sort of endured the same sort of um, histories and racial hierarchies um, that have been imposed upon us um, by European colonizers. So um, while race is framed just a little bit differently in Latin American countries, um, the racial hierarchy exists, right, with blackness at the bottom and blackness being a global experience of uh, racism, not just something that's particular to the U.S., right? Um, I want to start with a Fred Moten quote. Um, I don't want to take this in too academic of a direction. I will be providing a reading list for people who want to follow up. But what I love about Fred Moten in it is that he's able to sort of convey these really complex ideas in um, everyday language um, as praxis, right? And he says in the Undercommons, the problematic of coalition is that coalition isn't something that emerges so that you can come help me, a maneuver that always gets traced back to your own interests. The coalition emerges out of your recognition that it's fucked up for you in the same way that we've already recognized that it's fucked up for us. I don't need your help. I just need you to recognize that this shit is killing you too, however much more softly, you stupid motherfucker, you know? And I love that um, quote. I apologize for the language if anyone is sensitive to that, but there's um, the sense that, you know, as we sort of come together yet again after yet another police um, killing, you know, that we're examining these these topics yet again. You know, a lot of us who've been sort of organizing around this, um, doing labor around this for a long time, feel like um, things are happening really late. And there's this like rush to build coalitions um, and to do a lot of this handholding when it comes to um, addressing anti-blackness in our communities. Um, and I love what um, uh, Kat said earlier about, uh, you know, solidarity within ourselves, recognizing that the same violences that, um, you know, are inherent within anti-blackness affect all of us, right? Um, and so that coalition building is about, you know, this sort of mutual recognition. So first, you know, I kind of want to define what anti-blackness is and how to disambiguate it from racism. Um, racism is, you know, <laughs> something that we can point to as, as uh, structural violence, right? So like redlining is, is racist, police violence is, is racist. But anti-blackness is a little bit more pernicious than that. Um, it is, you know, typical attitudes, beliefs, deeply embedded common knowledge, like um, anti-blackness is um, so basic in the ways that we consider light, uh, white, and goodness, right, uh, to black and darkness as, as badness, right? Those are anti-black structures of thinking. Um, and they're also a set of behaviors, right? So um, the ways in which we comport ourselves and expect others to comport themselves um, you know, are, are based in anti-blackness, right? So some of these are like class-based behaviors, like um, talking a certain way or um, believing certain things about society, the world, how educated you are, how you raise your children, how many children you have, whether the father is present, um, you know, whether you uh, are in a nuclear family structure, all of these things um, express themselves as anti-blackness and they're pernicious and they're widespread and they're default. They're our default way of thinking, right? Um, many of our behaviors are so deeply rooted that it's hard to track when we're being anti-black and when it uh, does become identified, um, you know, we tend to become very fragile, uh, very, you know, defensive about um, being called on our weaknesses or on uh, limitations of the way that we see the world. Um, but I think where we need to start from rather than, you know, fielding everything as an attack or um, performing this kind of fragility like, oh, well, we face violence too, or, um, you know, 
whatever the case may be, recognizing that blackness is very specific as an, an experience, right? It's an extraordinary experience and it's global. It's a global, globally oppressed experience. Um, it's, you know, in the Americas, at, at the very least, it's a 400 year long condition stemming from slavery, right? Stemming from kidnapping, rape, um, extracted labor. Um, it was legally codified, right? Um, as an identity. The, the reason we know of black and white as a race is because it was first legally codified in the US. Um, you know, so legally codified, meaning that if you were black, you could not own capital, you could not own land, you could not uh, vote, right, until very recently. <laughs> um, you know, so all of these things have, you know, these histories that are specific to black experience that is, um, it's not just in poor taste when we say, oh, us too, or, uh, you know, say that, you know, we've experienced this as well. We have experienced our own structural violences as Latinx people, which I'll get to in just a minute. But there is something specific about blackness that I think we need to acknowledge and acknowledge as perpetuating, being complicit in, and um, benefiting from, right? Um, so, let, you know, let's kind of go backwards and, and, define what Latinidad is, um, whether Latinidad even really exists, right? Um, so there is this way in which we think of Latinx identity as being a racial identity or a racial category. And in some ways, because in the US it has been created or used um, as a racial category, it is, right? And that that is controversial because Latinx is not a race. It's it's just not. It's treated that way in the US um, for reasons, you know, that I won't get into. But um, Latinidad is in the same way that Americanness, right, contains blackness, it contains whiteness, it contains indigeneity, it contains Asianness. Um, and so Thinking of Latinx as a racial category itself is in and of itself anti-black. So saying like Latinos for black lives is anti-black because Latinidad contains blackness. So be, being careful about that language, right? Um, Latinidad itself is a, an anti-black and anti-indigenous construct. It's a way of thinking about race that is based in national identities because of the realities of colonization, right? We lost our um, tribal, our claim to, you know, tribal identity, and therefore it becomes an, eth an ethnic national identity that becomes racialized in the U.S. It doesn't mean it's a race, right? So, um, there's this way in which we sort of uh, sidestep our white privilege or don't want to acknowledge our white privilege um, because our, our own country's histories encouraged um, the eradication of indigeneity and blackness through encouraged miscegenation. Uh, mestizaje is what it's called, you know, this uh, mestizo, uh, which, you know, the, the end goal is always whiteness, right? The more mestizo you become, the more whiteness you take into the bloodline, which is called mejorando la raza, right? Which is a very specific Latinx anti-blackness. Um, so, you know, getting away from um, the ways in which we think of Latinx as a race, um, Latinidad as a raza, ra like even saying raza is pointing to this eugenic idea of la raza cosmica, right? The, the uh, ways in which mestizo is constructed as a race, but which is also based on anti-black and anti-indigenous violence. Um, our mixed raceness, most of us are, you know, uh, mixed in some way. Um, I think like that's where a lot of this fragility comes from. Um, mestizos especially, you know, there, there is this, this want to claim indigeneity and blackness, um, but also knowing that our mixedness is not consensual. Um, and that is a site of colonial violence, um, you know, is uh, inappropriate in the context of the conversation right now when we're talking about police violence, specifically anti-Black police violence. Um, and using our mixedness, right? So like um, in my family, we are mestizo, um, we are afrodescendiente, but we don't 
know those ancestors, so we can't claim that ancestry. We just know that it's part of our lineage and our heritage. Um, but we also cannot use that to claim space, right, in, within Black conversations. We can't use that to say the N-word, no matter whether it's used with us, right? I grew up in, um, in Houston. I write a lot about Houston and these shared social spaces between um, Latinidad and Blackness. And I grew up not only using the N-word, but being, it being used with me in a, like, totally, um, what is it, colloquial way, right? And it's not until, you know, I grew out of that community and that identity and, you know, recognized that um, I had the privilege to, right, transcend um, that cl class and, and social space that it was never appropriate, right? So there's always this learning process um, that shared social space doesn't even entitle you to use this kind of language or to try to appropriate that experience. Um, so, you know, I, I think a lot of this might be resonating with some Latinx folks and not others. And that's because Latinidad it, in and of itself is not a monolith, right? Um, Mexican American Latinidad is very different from Caribbean Latinidad. It's very different from Central American and South American Latinidad. Um, you know, a Brazilian person will have a very different experience of race and blackness than a Mexican American person, you know, from Texas, which is, um, you know, who I am, right? And so we're constantly negotiating these tensions and the identity container is insufficient to address all of these experiences. Um, and therefore our ways of thinking and talking about race will be insufficient. And that's okay, it's okay to be messy and it's okay to make these mistakes and it's okay to be corrected by black people and specifically black Latinos who are also, you know, really um, working to get their experiences, uh, which have been silenced and erased for much, much, much too long, um, you know, by this sort of hegemonic mestizo um, uh, depiction of our experience, right? Um, I actually do worse with outlines, but maybe I'm kind of, I'm kind of rocking this outline right now. Um, so, Let's talk about some typical Latinx anti-Black behaviors and beliefs and, and language. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm uh, running out of time here, but I just wanted to sort of, you know, talk about uh, ways that you can field these kinds of things. Um, you know, colorism is, is you know, the, the first thing that I think we kind of grapple with. Um, but I think there's also conventions in our language in the ways in which we talk about race. Um, our parents might use the term negrito or negrita um, in the diminutive, and that's to like sort of take the, the, um, the strong connotation of negro or negra out of the word, but it's infantilizing. And so we have to communicate to our parents and our, our extended family members gently. Um, that that is an infantilizing way of categorizing people and that, you know, um, there is nothing strong about saying negro negra, right? Um, so to come away from saying uh, those kinds of terms. Um, also, gently coaxing even people our own age, um, you know, or within our community that Latinidad is somehow separate or a different racial category. It's not. Um, um, it, Latinidad is basically American, Americanness, just Latin American. So we need to start dismantling ideas of Latinidad as um, separate or a racial category. Um, and what aboutism? You know, what about us? Um, you know, and I have been guilty of this as well, even within the last week, right? There have been. Um, you know, instances of Latino uh, uh, youth and, you know, deaths in, um, you know, the last few weeks due to police violence. And, um, you know, I will, I will share these stories, but I always wonder about what sharing even really means right now, whether it's about wanting to, uh, whether it's this like sort of whataboutism, or whether I'm contributing to this like larger canvas of police violence. That's a tension that I'm still grappling with right now and I'm still, you know, moving through right now. Um, but, you know, citing any other experience, 
um, of racial, capitalist, or structural violence is equal to blackness is anti-black. And um, especially when we fail to see if we've ever been called out or are part of a conversation, when we fail to see that we benefited from white privilege, um, as even as non-white people, you know, that's um, anti-black behavior. So, you know, um, even a sense of fragility when a black person calls us white, I'm not going to tell you to identify as white. I'm not going to ask you to identify with your oppressor. But what I, you know, especially if your lived experiences or your particular local history doesn't reflect uh, whiteness for you, um, you know, for instance, in agricultural states, um, you know, even mestizos are seen as not white, right? But not being fragile when a black person says you're white. It, it's because the perniciousness of anti-blackness, especially in the US, is that the black-white binary is constantly asserting itself. And so because it's systemically constantly reasserting itself, non-black people will fall on the white side, right? And we have to acknowledge that that's just the reality of anti-blackness. Um, and also in participating in systemic and institutional sabotage, learning respectability politics, learning when you are the good person of color and you know um, a black person who is also within your field or within your uh, space, you know, isn't um, socialized to meet those expectations, but you somehow know what those expectations are. That's anti-blackness too, right? Um, so these are just some things that are part of you know latinidad and, and latinx subjectivity in the u.s and ways that we can sort of catch um these sort of default ways of thinking about um blackness and anti-blackness and how we can you know start addressing them i'll share a reading list and um people to follow on twitter and um discourses to follow um i owe a lot you know to people doing the work every day just on twitter and in the discourse um but things that you can do just actually Um, I got an error message. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, um, you know, showing up beyond the protests, going to Black Lives Matter town halls, um, you know, doing meetings uh, in community, setting up mutual aid networks, um, recording police interactions, um, everyday interactions between a Black person and someone who is complaining or uh, calling the manager or whatever, um, you know, and uh, learning more about community policing and gently sort of uh, feeling uh, or uh, fielding family questions and uh, naming anti-black behaviors. So um, that's it. I'm sorry if I went over time. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure, you know, just like me, the audience and myself have learned so much from all great representations. Um, I would, I mean, I would like to elaborate that I really appreciate to all panelists, all validating how racism is entrenched in this society across race lines, within communities of color, and which makes it extremely hard to combat. But at the same time, you all gave us very specific um, suggestions and really highlight the importance of persistent, tenacious, and often patient approaches that we need to dismantle racism and specifically anti-Black racism among us, including our own loved ones. I'm not sure what I, let me try to uh, share my screen. Um, this one. Just to show you. Um, so this, the, this photo was taken 1968. Um, I don't know whether you can see it. Um, so this was the demonstration to free Huey uh, Newman from jail. And it says a yellow peril supports black power. Um, so I wanted to show you this because the term Asian Americans evidently was created at this time that they didn't have the term at the time. So Chinese, Japanese, what up, Filipinas, and they were told by the name of their uh, origin of national, uh, national origin and to sort of bring people together here that they create the term Asian American. And I learned a lot today from Vanessa that how complicated it is and often we don't mean it, but then we end up using the pretty racist term. Excuse me, Yun Sun, I'm getting yes? some messages. I'm getting some messages in the Q&A box that our audience can't hear us. Mm -hmm. um, hmm.
Uh, am at some point still... it, at some point it said that it had stopped recording, so I don't know right. if something happened with the recording. Tracy, I'm not sure if you can relaunch us. I lost sound for a while too, but now it's back. Can you all hear me now? I feel like the commercial. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Okay, well, let me see whether I can do this. Okay, so there's a lot of, I can hear you and I can hear you. Um, okay, so let me ask a question. So the Q and A's, there's a several questions that are sort of that comes together. Um, one of them is, I mean, many of them is the fact that we are all here and in a way that we are, we do share a very similar probably perspective about the racism within anti-black racism within the communities of color and how we need to better educate uh, others or do a better self-reflection. But the fact of the matter is that you know a large proportion of people of color are not second, I mean uh, there's a lot of diversities, extreme diversities. Like Vanessa well pointed out, Latinx or you know whatever the term that we use or Asians for that matter, it disguised the extreme diversity within each group by national origin, immigrant generation status, religion, language, just to name a few. So when you're trying to work together, especially like uh, it sounds like the audience as well as the panelists are predominantly second or later generation uh, Americans, how do you deal with the parents? How do you educate your own communities? And so the generational difference, I mean, recently I uh, read a New York Times article about how the young generations are educating their parent generation. And some of the questions uh, in the Q&A talked about what do you do, parents who don't see themselves as a pe uh, per person of color at all? That's not a real term for that, right? Um, and how do you ease them into conversation when they might have had ex uh, experienced the racism by other minorities, including Black, when they feel like this is so real? <laughs> how do you sort of the, engage them in conversation and how do you really help them in this sort of you know, coming together in solidarity? Any one of you want to answer? Catherine? Deb, I can talk to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, so I think that, you know, our parents or our elders in our community might not always identify in solidarity with Black communities. Certainly, they might see them as having a very different experience than them. They might have, you know, breathed in the negative racial stereotypes, but they also don't see themselves as white for the most part. I think that most Asian Americans would not say that they are white either. And so sometimes it starts from talking about that experience, you know, like what has your experience been in terms of how you've been dealt with? I mean, I know growing up, I might have cringed at some perspectives on black people that I heard and, and objected to them. But I also used to feel like, oh, my parents also claim racism way too much. Like, like, oh, it must have been racism that you didn't get this award or whatever. And I was like, no, 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 that can't be it. That can't be it. And now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, they, they were probably right. You know, so they, they do, they have experienced this, this in their lives, in their um, experiences in the U.S. as well. So I think it's building from that. Like, why do you think that that happens? Why do you think you've been treated this way? It's because of white supremacy. And what is the history of white supremacy in, in this country? it is based on the desire to justify the domination, the enslavement of the black population, the eradication of the indigenous population. And so that same pain that you've experienced is the reflection, a reflection in a different manner, you know, but it's all coming from stemming from the same tide. And I think another thing that I, you know, that I've found compelling in South Asian communities is to talk about um, imperialism and the fact that our countries were colonized by the British um, and so many people died and there was such a struggle to overthrow that colonialism. And so, and that colonialism was based 
debates on white supremacy and, and a sense of the uh, naturalness of white people dominating others. And so I think it's drawing from their own experiences, whether it's in the region itself or things that they've experienced in the United States and kind of building upon that. Because frankly, I think part of it is that there might not have a lot of interaction with, uh, with black people, or maybe they don't have any personal contacts and they've, they, they just don't have that experience to draw from. And so I have found those things to be com compelling for people. Um, and also uh, I think that there, there, there was this question about um, how is it that, why, like, so why is it that you say that the civil rights movement is what allowed Asian Americans to immigrate to this country and in, in a in, like what is the history of that and the history of that is that you know originally there there anybody could just get on a boat and come to this country and that's why like all of these arguments that oh my ancestors came here legally it's like there was no legal regime like there was no you just came here if you were white you just got off the boat a few years you were become a citizen um, and it was really anti Asianness that enacted these immigration laws um, in 1917, 1924, Asian Exclusion Act, and put quotas of like 100 people from India in a year. <laughs> so you can imagine how, how, what that trickle was compared to the millions who are coming in from Europe. And that's why our population is white. It was done majority white in this country. It was done by design. It was done to exclude other people. And it was the civil rights movement that basically pointed out that this was racist. To have a preferential hierarchy of nationalities um, was racist and it had to be abolished. And that's why we saw the Immigration Act um, change and allow the waves that have come now. And I, so I think history is just so important in, in, in the stories that we tell and the prehistories that it's not that, you know, oh, I, I just came to this country and this country gave me everything. You know, I hear that and I'm always like, no, 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 you created value by coming to this country and contributing to it. And frankly, if the white majority had their way, you wouldn't have been here. It was because of the struggles of, you know, the, the, the civil rights movement, primarily black Americans that allowed that opportunity to even be there for you. So, um, this, these are some of the strategies that I, I use to inculcate a sense of solidarity amongst all generations, but particularly perhaps the older generations. Catherine? Yeah, I was, I mean, Sadaf just uh, took the words out of my mouth, you know, a little sort of Asian American Studies 101, right? And I think it's, it's, so, it's so key to sort of know your own history. I remember how uh, just like mind blowing it was for me to learn about like the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act and you know the you know and the race based sort of origins national origins quota system which was like the immigration system you know from 1924 on till 1965 you know and um, and you know our schools don't teach us those things like you wouldn't learn about these things unless you actually like went to college and took classes you know usually that 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 would tell you about these things and so I was totally that kid in my family that was like you know what I learned in school today, blah, 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 you know, telling my parents and my aunts and uncles and everything. You know, I don't know to what extent was that actually really helpful or if that sunk in, but I think it is so important to sort of know our own history. Um, and on top of that, because my family's also primarily post-1965, so they didn't necessarily, like, they weren't necessarily familiar with that earlier history of exclusion, I think it's also important to know not only that the 1965 Immigration Act, which allowed them to also come in, was a result of civil rights pushes, but also, on the flip side of it, it also was very much a political tool on the part of the U.S. government as well, which was also very much informed by the Cold War, right? Um, and so like the reason that you with your engineering degree was able to come in, right, was served a particular purpose. And so this had nothing to do with you being inherently more deserving, right, um, to be here. Like that were political reasons for why you, this particular type of immigrant, you know, was brought in. And that's where the whole model minority stereotype even came to be, right? Um, and so those kinds of histories are so also so important to flag that like, that even the history of your, that your parent kind of benefit, right, of having made it in this country was also because of white supremacy, right? That white supremacy doesn't just cause your oppression, but also then can like give you these quote unquote apparent benefits, right? Um, that then, you know, and that's where the sort of divide and conquer strategy, right, comes from. Um, but another also real important rich history that I also want to flag is that 
there's also a really rich history of interracial solidarity, right, in, in America between different different racial groups. You know, if you look at, say, like, you know, the farm worker strikes, right, between Filipinos and Mexicans, right, or like in Hawaii, all those plantation strikes as well, that so many gains that we have um, come from interracial solidarity building. Vanessa, do you want to say one or two about this? If you can unmute first. Thank you. Um, I've been answering uh, questions in here. I see there's a lot of questions for you on the Q&A <laughs> box. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, someone asked, you know, how Latinos and, and Black folks can um, begin to build uh, solidarity. And, you know, there's no, there's not one answer for that. Um, I would say that it's a lifelong process of, you know, the sort of very tender and messy act of reconciliatory, building reconciliatory solidarities. I take that word reconciliatory from um, this uh, scholar named M. Jackie Alexander and her book, Pedagogies of Crossing. And um, I wanted to actually read this quote um, you know, that she wrote after the death of Gloria Ansaldúa, um, you know, which is a problematic figure, but I love what M. Jackie Alexander says. Um, she says, uh, what might Black women say to Chicana women to help ease the pain of this loss? We mourn with you. We feel your loss. We hold your pain. We did not accompany you to those fields in Texas as you face the noonday brunt of the sun. Um, continues, hang on. We grieve with you and we want ceremonies of reconciliation that link our goddesses and gods to each other, patterning, patterning new codices of forgiveness and triumph, sisters of the corn silk and sisters of yam, as your comadre Shiri Moraga put it. We petition the basket weavers to dream a new pattern of our knowing and loving that binds the permanent impermanence of our footprints in the sand. I believe it you know, begins with this acknowledgement of shared experience, um, this acknowledgement of <laughs> sorry, excuse me, of shared structural violence, um, and uh, you know, really dedicating our lives and our um, actions to Black liberation, um, you know, uh, police abolition, um, and you know, toward solidarity building, community building. I also would like to share um, my perspective that, you know, I, I see in the Q&A that some of you say, you know, I experienced sort of the other minority groups make jokes about Asians and, you know, what do you do? Um, some of the experience of racism by other minority groups are hurtful too. It's equally hurtful. Um, so when the experience is real, I don't think any of, you, any of us are saying that's not true. The experience are real. The fact of the matter, it's not like we are doing, a, say, oppression Olympics. So who is suffering the most and like whatever. What we are saying is that everybody's experience is real and it's painful. But a system that creates such inequality at this moment for Black lives is not going to be fair to anyone. So it might be Black today, it might be Latinx tomorrow, or you know when 9-11 happened, it was uh, Arabs and also South Asians. When coronavirus hits, it's Chinese and all Asians are singled out. So the system that creates the inequality, such entrenched inequality and racism, is gonna target different people at different moments and only to perpetuate the status quo. And I think this is the sort of the way that we can educate ourselves, educate other people, that unequal system is not helping them. So I wanted to sort of highlight that as well. And um, let me also um, add another question to the panelists. So race does not exist alone. It intersects with gender and class. There's a lot of intersection among these matters. So maybe you guys can um, sort of discuss how gender and class sort of pan out in what you have discussed in your presentation. Any who wanted to start first? Catherine, Sadat, Vanessa. Catherine? I, mean, I suppose thinking about class in particular, especially looking through an Asian American lens, um, it was brought up before that like, 
it's very easy for Asian Americans to really eat up the model minority myth, right? Because it's self-congratulatory, right? It makes us look good, right? Um, and I think, you know, bracketing, you know, the, pol the political use of that, right, which we've, we've addressed it, but it, it's also just inherently false. And I think um, when you look at uh, the data, it actually, you know, it, it, it's not, you know, if you just aggregate the data in particular, when you look at particular groups, such as refugee Asian communities, right, Hmong American or Cambodian American, right, that when you look at those socioeconomic m markers of success, that they're not reflective of the model minority myth at all. And so what that tells us is that these, you know, that because the model minority myth is precisely about class, right, because it's about these, you know, upward mobility and so forth, um, that it's not about culture, right, and it's certainly not, not anything about something inherently superior about your racial or ethnic group. It's about the conditions of migration, right, the conditions of migration that brought you to the U.S. in the first place. And so, like, so it's a, there's a world of difference between being, you know, an immigrant, you know, from, say, Korea with a college degree, you know, being brought over here, you know, to work as a computer engineer versus, you know, having been brought over as a refugee, you know, and, you know, with the kind of trauma and, you know, not being able to bring anything with you, you know, when you arrive and then, you know, being placed by the government in certain neighborhoods and so forth. So it's a world of difference, you know, and so I think, um, so that's where I was sort of thinking about the, the class piece, right, is that you can see how, um, you know, these like socioeconomic markers become politicized in racist ways, but if we really break them down, you can see that there's like cracks in a lot of the narratives that have, that are being perpetuated there, even on that level. Right. And just to also add, uh, in terms of model minority stereotype, as much as it's, uh, it looks positive, it always has a double side, right? So it's not all that positive right. anyway. So we're all seen as a threat. Right. Way. And then at the same time, it's uh, joined with a perpetual foreigner stereotype, which COVID-19 really lay bare. That go back to your country and, you know, what country? Well, they were born here. They can't go anywhere. Um, but sort of the foreignness, perpetual foreigner. Mm -hmm. And right. it, same thing applies to Latinx communities about going back to Mexico, whatever. So whatever the stereotype, even including the positive one, was created with a purpose. So we need to educate ourselves and the community, including our parents' generation, that even the good ones, looking good ones, are not really, it doesn't have a good intention. So in terms of class and gender, uh, Sadaf or Vanessa, do you have anything to add? You don't have to. <laughs> no, I, I think especially, you know, the class piece is where um, we see a lot of overlap um, with, you know, between Latinx and, and Black experience. I think that, you know, the term BIPOC sort of uh, stems from that, you know, these sort of, sort of um, internalizations and uh, structuralizations of colonial um, hierarchical systems, right? You know, the, um, uh, there's this another Jackie Alexander quote who I just revisited today about, you know, the reservation, the barrio, and um, the ghetto sort of sharing these internalized colonial um, structures. Um, I'll find the quote and I'll, when I make the reading list, I'll, I'll cite all my quotes. Um, and I think that, you know, class is, uh, for, for a lot of us, um, racially determined, right? Um, if you um, come from Bracero workers, if you um, come from, uh, you know, in indigenous uh, lineages, um, you know, uh, if you're an American descendant of slavery, your class is predetermined in a lot of ways. Um, wealth has been extracted from you in a lot of ways. There have been uh, legally codified barriers to wealth and opportunity. Um, the biggest difference is that, um, you know, for us, we, our, our labor was not extracted and stolen right, um, in terms of slavery. There are legacies of unpaid feudal work in uh, Mexican and indigenous histories. Um, my family uh, were unpaid cotton laborers, uh, feudal workers um, in Torreon and in uh, the Texas borderlands historically, but that still doesn't mean that I get to claim this legacy of slavery, right? And in doing so, um, if I were to try to claim it, or tr you know, if someone from a Bracero background or a working class background were to try to claim the same experience of blackness and slavery, that is again, that whataboutism 
um, you know, that, that deeply embedded anti-blackness where we're trying to claim space within uh, discussions of violence, where we can still do this liberatory work, but understanding that working toward eliminating anti-black violence, anti-black structural violence, class violence, is actually eliminating our violence, right? A, a violence against us. All of our oppressions are interconnected. And if we begin with blackness, then those things, you know, will liberate us all, right? Yeah. And I also wanted to point, I mean, um, answer to the Q&A that, you know, it's not, of course, not just gender and class, but of course, sexuality. And there's, you know, many other uh, several social identity issues that intersect and complicate the issue. Um, I believe we are running out of our time. Um, there's any burning comments that you guys want to make the panelists? Because I know there's a lot of questions to Vanessa and all of you uh, from the Q&A box and, you know, hopefully uh, the audience will have a chance to connect and ask questions if they have any. And there's many, many things that we can discuss and talk about, but the deaf, do you have wanted to? Yeah, something? sure. There was one question that I just wanted to address, which is, sure. you know, we talk about how to combat anti-blackness within our communities, but how about when we are kind of taken into the confidence of white people who think that we we're, we're down with the types of things that they're saying and they kind of loop us in with them. I mean, the, the, the most basic thing is to always say that this is wrong. I don't agree with you. This is wrong. Or if it's set, set as a joke, like, what do you mean by that? If it's not set out right, but just kind of like, what do you mean by that? Like just questioning it, stopping it, making an intervention. And I know it's so hard and especially for young people and kids in school, it should not be your responsibility to do that. But it's something that we have to cultivate because unfortunately sometimes we are kind of brought in like, oh, aren't you with us on this anti-blackness? And we have to say assertively, absolutely not. And that is offensive to me. And, um, but you know, I, I'm with you in that uncomfortableness when that happens. Like, why do you think I would, why, you know, why are you, why do you think I'm a party to this? Um, but beyond that, I mean, I don't know what the plans are for this. I'm happy to stay on and just at least answer some of the questions in the Q&A. I don't know what this means, what your, what your plans are for the call. I just had a, a few concluding comments to make, but actually, um, Sadaf, I wanted to push on the question a bit more because I, I also come from a South Asian American background, um, and so I'm familiar with um, particular gendered racial and colorism issues. Um, and so I was wondering if you or, or Kat or Vanessa could speak to um, in terms of the way we socialize our children as they're growing up, the way we gender our children and what we teach our children about their own skin color and how that in turn could affect their views of anti-blackness, right? Um, and so I'll give you an example. I know young women in South Asian communities are often encouraged to be quote unquote fair. I'm sure you're familiar with that term, right? Being lighter skinned um, to the extent of, you know, I know some, some young women often um, perhaps to an unhealthy degree, you know, use sunscreen and wear, fit, cover their face to preserve the lightness in their skin. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak to any issues like that um, and how that might manifest on a larger scale um, in terms of coming, once they come into themselves essentially and become adults, um, functioning adults in society and how that kind of might be a bigger learning curve um, in terms of speaking back to anti-blackness if they've kind of experienced it, them, not anti-blackness, but the colorist issues themselves. I mean, I've totally become that auntie in my family that tries to shut any of those kinds of comments down because those are also just such casual comments in my family too, right? Like I was also like complimented a lot as a kid for being fair skinned, you know, and um, and I noticed like even it's, it, it persists, you know, I have uh, little nephews who are, who are Filipino and so they're darker. And of course there's always a comment about like, oh, you know, make sure they don't stay out in the sun for too long or something like that. And, um, you know, and, and so I'm always the, the one to jump in and say like, okay, we, we do not do that here, you know? Um, and I'm also very sensitive to, and to try to loop in the gender, um, uh, you know, gender into there too. Like, uh, you know, one of my nephews, you know, he's like, he's a little brown boy and 
he also has been pegged as sort of like a rambunctious kid at school. And so I'm very aware of how black and brown boys are disciplined from an early age. And so to try to then, I don't know, like to, you know, to really have conversations about like, okay, how do you then respond to a teacher who sort of has already kind of targeted him as like a troublemaker, you know, and what does that mean? And, and I think my family, because we're so uh, quick to kind of comply, be like, well, you don't want him to be the troublemaker. You want him to be the good student, you know, but to, to be willing to sit down and really break down, okay, but you know, what was that really about, you know? And, and so just, I don't know, I guess I don't have an easy answer to that, but I guess the, my point is to like, you know, to allow ourselves to really pause in these moments that seem to be very taken for granted, right? right. And actually, just this morning, the NPR had a, a discussion about the whitening products. And in India, apparently, a company that takes up 70% of the sales in the whitening product is changing the way they're um, advertising. And they were saying it's largely because of the, the Black Lives Matter movement that's out, reaching out globally, that why do we uh, favor uh, lighter skin? And the history is that it started more the class issue. That's because of the most of the low income class, low class members were out in the field working in darker versus the ruler uh, class where they were much more light. So that then that became intertwined with sort of the, you know, white whiteness. So that get intensified. So there are some sort of the promising uh, or even hopeful signs that the Black Lives Matter will outreach globally and will make change as much as if sort of this racial ideology is global phenomenon, that Black Lives Matter movement will also equally have the impact globally too. So, um, and I know Tasman had a few things that you wanted to close the sessions with and you know, the panel members are happy to, you know, you're welcome to stay, but also wanted to give chance to Tasman to give some closing remarks too. You know? Okay, yeah, I got, um, caught myself right before I started talking. Um, uh, just a reminder, before you sign off, um, would you please take the poll that has been sent out in the chat box, um, just some quick uh, feedback on this on today's session. Um, and okay. Um, so to conclude, um, I'm going to quote Bell Hooks once again, um, that love is an act of will, both an intention and an action. So I thank you all for your will to listen today, for the intention I hope it has given you in your minds and hearts, and for the action I hope you all are able to take as a result of the ideas presented. Um, thank you especially to all the wonderful people at the CSRPC and the CII for sponsoring this event. Um, there's a lot of people working behind the scenes who have supported um, this, uh, what will hopefully be an ongoing conversation series um, with different individuals um, on, e on every panel that we have. Um, and then of course, thank you especially to each of our panelists, um, Sadaf, Vanessa, and, and Kat, and our moderator, Yoon Sun. Um, we hope that the discussion today will lead to many more discussions for all of you, both private and public, um, as we all continue to fight against racism and do all we can to uplift our peers, work towards justice, and stand unified in the face of racial oppression and tyranny. Um, our next panel is tentatively scheduled for July 8th, but more information and confirmation of that date will be will be sent out um, soon. And so, Kat, you kind of... Um, already said the quote that I was going to close with. So Audre Lorde's quote, revolution is not a one-time event. That's also one of my, my favorite quotes um, because I think it emphasizes the need to be perpetually engaged um, in this fight. Um, and so I hope all of you will join us in maintaining the repeated actions of revolution against oppressive systems. Um, and thank you once again for joining us.